Today's gospel is one of the strangest stories, strangest times, strangest moments in all of Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus is out in Gentile territory, a long, long way from his home, and in this shadowy, strange place, he's approached by this sad, strange man. This, is, this man is said to be possessed by demons. We would simply say today that he is mentally ill because he screams, he runs around with no clothes on, he's deranged, and he's so sick that he's been sent out to the cemetery to stay. Well, in dramatic fashion, Jesus heals the man and delivers him of all the afflictions that he has. The demons are cast out into a herd of pigs that rush over headlong over the cliff and into the sea. And as I said, this is a very strange story. This wild scene ends with a man clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, which is kind of code word for sitting at his feet as a teacher. The man is not only healed by Jesus, he becomes a student of Jesus. In fact, this man, by my reckoning, becomes Jesus' very first Gentile student. <clears throat> but then the story takes another interesting turn. Jesus tells the man, go home, and tell everything that God has done for you. Go home, go back to that place that ran you out of town so long ago. Go home to those who, whom your illness has separated you from. Go home, go tell, go witness to what God has done in your healing. And the man does just that. He goes, he preaches over the city, all about what Jesus had done for him. And he doesn't go home and just witness, he witnessed to everybody in town. And this is a strange twist to this strange story. As a child, I used to pray at night that I would get sick before morning so I wouldn't have to go to school and take that test that I had not studied for. Not that being sick is all that much fun, but when you're sick, then you're sort of relieved of all your responsibilities. You're excused from the task that you normally would do. Sickness frees us from the burdens of life. Our only job when we're sick it's just to get well. This poor man has suffered for many years. He has not had the joy of children to wish him happy Father's Day. He has not had a job. He hasn't had any money. He hasn't had any friends. <clears throat> and what does Jesus tell him to do with the first minutes of his health and freedom and wholeness? He gives the man a job to do. He tells him to go tell everyone what God has done for him. In the story, people ask Jesus to leave their town. But then, Jesus tells this man, with no theological training, no education that we know of, to go back into that town and tell them what God has done. And the man does just that. He becomes one of the first witnesses, one of the first evangelists, even though he would be perfectly justified just to go back home and take on the joys of an ordinary life and relax and enjoy be, being in his right mind but he goes out and he preaches all over town that God is active, that God is here, 
that God is a healing love. Now, strange as this final turn might seem, I've been here long enough to meet some people in this congregation who embody this story. Jesus has touched you. Jesus has delivered you. Some of you, Jesus has healed you. And Jesus has spoken to you. And you are blessed. But you just didn't sit back and enjoy all those blessings. You also felt commissioned, called to a special work, called to witness to the one that had been the blessing in your life. Baptism is a time in the life of a believer when we are marked as Christ's own, when we, our sins are washed away, and we are made ready for discipleship. At baptism, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we are commissioned to share our faith with other people. It is a holy moment when we are called to a life of service to Jesus Christ. A commissioning event that where, where we are sent out to live and to tell what God has done for us. I hope you can think back to your baptism, to your confirmation, and remember that at that baptism and confirmation, you were called, you were sent. Because God has something very special for you to do. During the two congregational meals that we have shared and the table talk that went on in the fellowship hall, our transition team got the message loud and clear that you believe that Christian education is a primary responsibility of this congregation. It is important for us adults to share our faith with younger generations and do it as they have done it for 2,000 years before us. It is the way God uses us to assure that the church continues to grow and to flourish in the next generation. We are clearly called as a family of faith to make disciples of our youngest members. During this summer, Lauren Shook and Matt Koppel are working hard to build up our youth program at Star Mount. They are busy meeting on Sunday nights and doing weekly service projects in the community and making plans to go to the youth conference, and they're having a little fun in the process and eating a lot too. <laughs> We have been busy the last week trying to clean out and resurrect our youth room in the basement. It is very important for us to provide an engaging program for our youth. The Barner Group, a Christian research organization, conducted a nationwide survey of young Christians in an attempt to discover when faith decisions are being made by young adults. The research indicated that the decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ was made during or just after a youth mission trip, a summer church camp, or a Christian youth conference. 87% of young adults today say that they made their decision about faith following one of those events. When our youth are busy doing the kinds of activities they're doing, they are on those trips and those conferences, they are open in some special way that we don't understand to the coming and the speaking of the Holy Spirit. Oh, by the way, as a side note in that research, the Barner Group found that 78% of young adults decided their occupation right after one of those 
youth vents. This, in, this indicates to me that it is imperative that we offer opportunities for our youth to be engaged in education and camp and service opportunities. It is critical to their faith formation and it is even a part of setting their own vocational goals. Parents and grandparents, you are on the front lines of making sure that your children are given the opportunity to get away to one of those life-changing events where God speaks to them and calls them to believe and commissions them for a life of service. I know that our kids today are busy, but their participation in these faith-forming events are critical for their future. We need, by the way, volunteers to help us with Bible school in August, we need volunteers to cook or provide food on Sunday nights for our youth because they can really put it away. <laughs> we need your time and your final financial resources and your talents if we are to do a good job of leading youth into their faith. So I invite you this summer to be thinking about our children and youth and to remember them in your prayer. Bob Overman is now going to come and share some of his own faith experiences with you. Thank you and good morning. When Ray told me that uh, the theme of the service today was a crazy man comes to God, he thought it would be an ideal opportunity for me to share my faith. <laughs> so, thank you. I did tell him I wasn't the only crazy member of the congregation. I mean, as long as we have Kirk Cronenfield and Drake Dowler, and <laughs> he said, no, this is your time. I was raised in a family of Methodists. I hope you won't hold that against me. My first personal faith moments occurred in worship at Grace United Methodist Church with Reverend, later Bishop, Ernest Fitzgerald in the pulpit. It was the first time in my young life that I wanted to hear what was said so much that I stayed awake to hear it. <laughs> Through church and school, I became interested in music. After I'd done a couple of musicals in high school, I announced to my family that I was going to major in music in college. The news was received with less enthusiasm than I'd hoped. <laughs> my brother, who was 13 years older and sort of saw himself as the father figure after my father died when I was eight, took me aside and said, listen, I love you, so I'm gonna tell you the truth. I've heard you sing. You're not all that good. <laughs> you need to keep your singing as a hobby and find something that will be a true profession to major in in college. After praying about it, I decided that music was the only path for me. And a few years later, toward the end of my undergraduate studies, I had the honor of singing in a concert at the Metropolitan Opera as winner of the National Metropolitan Opera auditions. The concert was broadcast live over National Public Radio, and there were more than 4,000 people in attendance. Afterward, my brother came up, put his arms around me, and said, See, I always knew you could do it. <laughs> I took a break after the Met auditions and went to work as an entertainer in a hotel in New Hampshire and then in a club in Miami. While singing my show in the club, a gentleman approached me and asked if I'd be interested in singing on the Royal Viking Cruise Line. Lots of pretty ladies, life at sea, why not? I began as an entertainer, became an assistant cruise director, then a cruise director, and finally shipboard entertainment coordinator for all three of the Royal Viking ships. It was a great job and I was well compensated, but I kept feeling that this was not what I was supposed to be doing. Part of my job was to lead worship services on Sunday. So the next Sunday I spoke about making decisions with God's help through the power of prayer. After church, I went out on deck during the lunchtime and I walked to the bow of the ship to have a few moments alone just to reflect. When I went out there, it was cloudy and overcast. It wasn't a very pretty day. The wind was blowing. 
But I stood out there and I bowed my head and I closed my eyes and I prayed. I said, Lord, I feel like I'm supposed to be singing opera, not entertaining on a cruise ship. Could you please give me some sign that I am not out of my mind? When I opened my eyes, the sky in front of me was bright blue. The sun was shining full in my face. If you know anything about being at sea, you know that the weather can change on a dime. And some people would just call it a weather phenomenon. I chose to see it as a sign from God. So I left my secure job. I went back to North Carolina to study and to prepare for an opera career. While at UNCG rehearsing one day, I met this pretty blonde co-ed who was a freshman voice major. Eventually, we became friends, and after a while, we went out. Our first date was to worship at Starmount Presbyterian Church. <laughs> I had been hired as a section leader, and after they heard Rhonda sing, she was hired as a section leader as well. Eighteen months later, when I left to take a position in the Opera House in Salzburg, Austria, she transferred to the Mozarteum Conservatory, also in Salzburg. Needless to say, her parents were thrilled. <laughs> Not. The thought of their young daughter going off to Europe at age 19, coincidentally to the same city in which her boyfriend lived, was not at the top of their most loved outcomes list. They claimed, among other things, that this was against God's will. But I had a secret weapon. I brought Reverend Dr. George Carpenter into the party, and he managed to convince them that I was not sent by the devil, and eventually they reluctantly went along. However, when our meeting was over, George whispered in my ear, you realize if anything happens to her, I will kill you. <laughs> Shortly after we arrived in Europe, it was clear my career was not going to leave me in one place. I sang a production in Germany and was offered an engagement there. Rhonda and I saw each other as much as possible, but our careers kept taking us to different places. And after a whirlwind 15-year courtship, most of it long distance, we decided to marry and figure it out together. We bought a home in Greensboro, Rhonda took a job here, and I commuted to Europe to sing. It was working fairly well until we became pregnant with Jenny, and I got a call after a performance one night that Rhonda had been taken to the hospital with premature contractions and that the baby was in danger. I've never been so scared and I've never felt so distant, 5,000 miles away in the, south of, in the south of France. Once again, I prayed. I prayed for guidance and help. The next morning I woke knowing that I had to go home. I went to see the general manager of the Opera Theater in Nice and asked for compassionate leave to go home to my wife when the Carmen production ended two days hence. He agreed and said he would release me from my next contract to give me some additional time with my wife. After finishing the Carmen production, I flew home to be with Rhonda. Once home, I began to cancel productions one by one until Jenny was born and ended up canceling more than two years because after I saw that child and the one that followed her, I couldn't bear to leave. Jenny's birth was one of the three happiest days of my life. She was healthy and strong, at least at first. The hospital had given Rhonda a drug to help with pain, to which she had a terrible reaction. She was so sick and so out of it that when the nurse came back into the room with Jenny all cleaned up and said, I have a visitor for you, she said, I don't want a visitor, I just want to sleep. <laughs> Fortunately, I wanted visitors, so uh, we had some quality daddy-daughter time until Rhonda recovered. The hospital folks really wanted Jenny to nurse, and she couldn't seem to get the hang of it. Uh, I went along for a couple of days, but when Jenny lost so much of her birth weight that she was placed in the NICU, I had another conversation with God, after which I informed the nice folks at Women's Hospital that Jenny was going to be fed by bottle and by any other means until she gained enough weight to be out of trouble. They let me go into the NICU and feed her through a tube taped to my little finger to help her nursing reflex. I spent a lot of time feeding and praying with that baby, and I could feel her getting stronger and pulling harder on my finger with each feeding. While Rhonda was still getting over being sick, I got to feed Jenny night and day. It was a blessing I would have never asked for, 
but one for which I'm eternally grateful. Well, that got, girl got stronger quickly and became a world-class nurser. When Mary was born, there was another scare. The doctor lost her heartbeat just after contractions started and kept losing it periodically. She finally announced that she was going to do an emergency C-section, to which Rhonda responded, I can deliver this baby. The doctor was arguing, Rhonda was adamant, and I was praying as hard as I could. Finally, the doctor looked at me in exasperation, and I said, she can do it. She's got singer muscles. <laughs> Mary was born four minutes later. No C-section. And she nursed like a champ from the get-go. <laughs> Faith has always been a part of our lives, individually and as a family. We attended church and sang in the choir. One day, I was asked to help plant a new church as music director. I agreed, and a new passion was born. From that small planted church, I moved to a larger church, where I was serving when the phone rang one Sunday afternoon with Gail Owens on the other end, asking me if I'd consider applying for the position I now hold at Starmount. After hearing what the position entailed, I almost said no. I was working full-time as director of vocal studies at Greensboro College and didn't think I could take on this much more. But the church said they would work with me, and when they offered the position, I accepted. Don't think I didn't pray a lot about that decision. But again, I believe God led me to this church, to all of you, and to all these beautiful folks over here. At Star Mount, we realize that music is worship and we are proclaiming God's word and singing and ringing his praises through our song. We spend a great deal of time talking about the meaning of what we sing and why it's important. We understand that musical abilities are a gift from God and must be used to glorify God. Beginning this Father's Day afternoon, my daughters and I will take part in a week-long musical event that will take us to half a dozen churches to share the music of faith with folks from all over Central North Carolina. To share this worship experience with Jenny and Mary is one of the best parts of being a dad. How wonderful to be able to bring the gift of music to friends we have yet to meet, and then to bring it back to Star Mountain, where we will share it with you next Sunday, right here. For me, faith will always begin with family, be strengthened by friends and fellowship, and be most profoundly expressed through music. Thank you for allowing me to share my faith journey with you. American author and theologian Frederick Beekner observes the following about the Christian life. He said, the place God calls you to be is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger come together. When we offer our children and youth the opportunity to participate in worship, youth groups, Sunday school, youth conferences, services, and on mission trips, we are offering them the opportunity to discover these places of great gladness and great need. We are allowing them to discover that they have the freedom to share, to explore, to discuss, to question, to try on their faith apart from their families, and that discipleship is not just the domain of mother and daddy, but it's a relationship with Christ that is theirs and they can claim it on their own. <laughs> so, remember your baptism, remember your confirmation. These are events or the beginning of God's call on your life. Many of us are still clinging to the safety of the shore we're standing on. So I challenge you to sort of let go and let God lead you. <clears throat> Allow yourself to be caught up in the current of baptism and, and kind of swept along by the swirling waters of this mystic river that connects Christians across time and space for 2,000 years. 
from the Jordan River to now our own baptism. And we grow through the teaching and the leading of our adults so that our children may grow into who they are to be tomorrow. So dance and splash and swim in the waters of your baptism, buoyed by God's grace and mercy and purpose for your life. Then you will discover and respond to who he is calling you to be. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you not only came to us, you not only touched us, healed us, and loved us, but you also called us. Help us, good Lord, not only to enjoy your blessings, but also to obey your commandments. Remind us that we are not only to be beneficiaries of your care, but we are the recipients of your call. Help us anew to discover what you have for us to do. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.